and Russia also supported it. This, the success of reform was in danger if a critical mass of market and private enterprise was not formed fast enough. A semi-reform system would maintain major distortions that would cause people to see privileges and subsidize and would deter investment. The social and political costs of slow reforms would be much greater because a semi-reform system could not perform well. People were prepared to accept only a limited period of suffering. Shock therapy was applied in Poland, Czechoslovakia and three Baltic states. In opposition to radical reform program, numerous gradual reform programs were formulated. Some favored more gradual deregulation of foreign trade or prices. Others wanted more gradual reduction of inflation rates, budget deficits and monetary expansion. Many argued that the quality of privatization was more important than its speed. The opponents of gradual reform would minimize social suffering. I'm sorry, the opponents of radical reforms were diverse. Some, of, some were theoretical economists who believed that more Gradual reform would minimize social suffering. Others, ranging from social democrats to communists, wanted to minimize the role of market. Gradual reform came to dominate uh, in uh, most of the former Soviet Union countries. Late in the day, Professor Joseph Stiglitz of Columbia University became the leader of the gradualists. Inflation was the main economic problem in the early transition. Only Central Europe and the Baltic states succeeded in their early stabilization efforts. Most of other countries faced new financial crises, notably Bulgaria in 1996, 1997, Russia in 1998. Privatization has been the most controversial reform because it is a conspicuous distribution of wealth. Moreover, privatization has been monumental and unprecedented in scope. The privatization of large enterprises has been most controversial. The official measure of declines in output have been shocking in that time. The prior over-industrialization in the socialist era has disappeared and service sectors have expanded sharply. The huge military industrial complex has shrunk to Western European dimensions. The decline in standard of living has been much less than the real contraction in output because consumption has grown sharply as a share of GDP and because much of the prior investment was forced and therefore not very valuable. International assistance has been greatly disputed. Jeffrey Sachs argues that the West should have done much more and earlier for the transition countries while many others have complained about the International Monetary Fund being too, intervention, being too interventionist, interventionist. Outcome have varied remarkably in terms of political system, economic system and economic route. Three trajectories are apparent. Radical reformers in Central Europe and the Baltic, Baltic state, Baltics, have built democratic and <coughs> dynamic market economies with predominantly private ownership. Gradual reformers and most former Soviet republics in most former Soviet republics have uh, had uh, greater problems achieving democracy. Their market economies are still married by bureaucracy. Though most property has been privatized. Uh, three countries, Belarus, Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan, have maintained their old dictatorship, state control and dominant public ownership, doing little but ejecting the Communist Party. Transition economies have brought a few new insights to economics. How to launch the transition matters so much not because the workers or the people objected, but it turns out because the elite were the strong interest group that had to be modified. Privatization and enterprise restructuring have been the most pioneering areas and the final verdict on their success is not yet in. Corruption is widespread. By this tends to happen in all countries where government officials have a large amount of discretionary power, not just in transition 
economies. So, uh, how was the situation uh, uh, in, the 2000, in 1992, 1993, 1995? You can see some uh, figures. So, uh, foreign trade, for example, dropped by 7.3 compared with the 1992 figure. Uh, decline in export was recorded in trade with all relevant regional blocks and countries. The sharpest drop was recorded in export to Czech Republic after the independence. Uh, after the uh, establishment of uh, independent Slovakia, the level of trade between Czechs and Slovakia in 1993 reached only two thirds of the 1992 level. So uh, I can see uh, the other uh, figures. Uh, you can see that the 1993 uh, annual decline was four percent of GDP, and. Uh, trend in development of the industrial structure towards energy, material intensive production at the lower processing stage continued. Uh, for example, if you... Uh, I can uh, tell you that at the end of the 1996, highways represented only 1% of the road system of Slovakia one person. It was not more than 20 kilometers. Uh, for example, the average monthly salary uh, doesn't exceed uh, $400. It was only 23% of the amount of Vienna in that time. So the situation was uh, not optimistic. But uh, In 2002, so uh, after the after the major uh, uh, reforms, macroeconomic reforms, after the 1998-1999, uh, the years, uh, the period between 2002-2007 uh, was very very good because the GDP uh, grew by six percent uh, a year on average level. So, for example, 2007 uh, it was uh, more than 10 percent. Uh, Unemployment uh, in this period fell from 80% to 10% and inflation from 12 to 3% between 2000 and 2007. So, uh, the main... Uh, Slovakia owes its economic success mainly to the central-right government of uh, Prime Minister Mikola Turinda, which governed the country for two consecutive terms between 1998 and 2006. And as I mentioned before, the, the Minister of Finance in the time was, and uh, the Deputy of Prime Minister was uh, your, the, uh, was your uh, Prime Minister main economic advisor today, Ivan Miklos. Uh, this long period in power enabled uh, Prime Minister Turin to carry out a number of structural reforms and uh, this government also decided that Slovakia should quickly adopt the Euro. Uh, what was good uh, is that uh, the Fico government continued to, after uh, 2006 working towards rapid accession to the Eurozone. It also decided to make only minor connections to the economic policy, such as abolishing the symbolic healthcare changer charges, increasing minimum wages and taxing uh, the highest earners. And these, challenge, these changes didn't uh, undermine the key principles of economic policy which the preceding cabinet had developed. So the main objectives, you can see the performance, 2001-2006, GDP growth, inflation, unemployment, and uh, foreign debt, perhaps a percentage of GDP. So, and uh, the sources of Slovakia's success uh, was, as you see, uh, liberal economic reforms, uh, opening uh, to foreign investors, and uh, undertake measures to quickly introduce the euro.
the structural economic reforms implemented by the Turin government, namely tax pension and health care reforms, the introduction of more flexible labor legislation and the launching of broad privatization process seems to have had the most significant impact. Uh, another important priority of Slovakia's economic policy concerns attracting foreign investments, one of the objectives for this being to reduce the unemployment rate. Slovakia was also the first country in the Central Europe region to undertake concrete measures with a view to entering to, uh, the Eurozone. Adop adoption of uh, the Euro was regarded as the most favorable solution due to the small size of the Slovak economy and its close ties with the EU countries. So in 2003, the Slovak government adopted a strategic plan for accession to the Eurozone in 2009, which was then consistently implemented. And Slovak uh, yeah, entered the Eurozone as planned on 1st January 2009. You can see the, uh, some uh, statistic data uh, in the covering the period 2012-2016 uh, and you can see uh, big progress in the uh, rate of unemployment uh, now unemployment is around 6-7% uh, so uh, that's the big success for Slovakia because uh, it was a really uh, important political problem unemployment as a, as a, as a topic and uh, You, we can see that since joining the EU in 2004, Slovakia's real GDP has grown faster than uh, in any other EU member state at uh, an average rate of 3.8 per year. Uh, in the post-crisis period, it has been one of the fastest growing Euro area member states with GDP rising by almost 3% per year. Its excessive government deficit was corrected in 2003, 2013, and today the unemployment rate is, at, as I said, it's the lowest in uh, seven years. Uh, a reassuring macroeconomic outlook uh, can be, of course, best understood in the context of Slovakia, many economic strong points. Foreign direct investment, particularly in the automotive industry, has undoubtedly been a major driver of Slovakia success. But strong foreign direct investment in flows are also a testimony to the attractiveness of the countries as a cost competitive, well situated, and flexible production location. And with Land Rover Jaguar looking set to open a new production site in Slovakia this year, it would become the fourth large car manufacturer in the, in the country. Who would have thought that Volkswagen acquisition in 1991 of a production facility for Skoda cars in Bratislava would help turn the country over the past two and a half decades into one of the Europe's largest car manufacturing hubs? On the other hand, we should bear in the mind that the success of the past may not necessarily be a good guide to the future. It's quite possible that new investment and growth in the automotive sector will slow or even stall. Maybe other industries make up for, maybe they won't. The practically relevant question in this respect is what policymakers and companies can do to minimize the risk of slowdown and maximize the chances of both current and new economic activities flourishing. Competitiveness and innovation will inevitably hold the key to economic success in our increasingly knowledge-based economies. Slovakia faces a challenge in need of addressing to improve to its business environment and public administration. Whether you ask citizens, domestic or foreign businesses, or organizations such as the World Bank or the World Economic Forum, each survey on this topic points to a number of challenges complicating daily life but also the setting up and running of a business. Corruption is perceived to be a significant problem in many areas of life. Another problem confronting Slovakia is a stark regional divide. There can be no doubt 
that Bratislava has been both the source and the major beneficiary of Slovakia's economic success. In fact, the region of Bratislava is the sixth richest region in the entire EU when adjusting for purchasing power differences between countries, ahead of Paris, Stockholm and Vienna. Unemployment is running at 6% or maybe now today it's maybe around 4 Verging on full employment, Bratislava GDP per capita is nearly twice as high as the EU average at 186%. But the region East Slovakia is only one third as rich, at only 53% of the EU average. So 183 and 53, and uh, it is only 300 kilometers. Other, more central region of, Slo uh, of Slovakia are not performing much better, neither in GDP nor in unemployment terms. Even life expectancy in Bratislava region is two years higher than in the rest of the country. So the regional divide suggests that the benefits of Slovakia's growth have been our shape in an unequal way across the country. Finally, given shortcomings in the labor market and education system, there is scope for putting Slovakia's human resources to better use. So, uh, we need to diversify our economy, we need to solve our education system, we need to solve our public administration. That uh, uh, is what uh, that are our main challenges today, after, after 20 years. 25 years of, of uh, real transformation processes. So thank you for your attention and I will be very glad if uh, we can discuss about, about your experience uh, from your reforms, how can we see uh, and how can we compare your situation mm -hmm. with our situation. Uh, you have already shown a Slovakian way to democracy and how Slovakia became political and, economic, and, and economically a uh, strong country. Will you give some advice to Ukraine uh, how Ukraine can build democracy because uh, now we have such a problem as corruption, populism, with the amount of middle class and absence of civil society? Yeah. Uh, as I uh, mentioned uh, in my presentation, uh, there is a lot of uh, challenges uh, you're facing uh, now today, and uh, uh, what is uh, what is the main maybe message from our experiences is that uh, uh, these problems uh, is not caused uh, because of reforms, but. Uh, these uh, problems uh, show us that we need reform, more reforms. And this is the message which is, uh, I think, not very popular in uh, between the politics. And people are usually afraid. I, uh, they, they usually all of us uh, don't like too many changes. Yeah, and uh, uh, because you don't know if uh, the future will be ba better than the present. Right. And uh, uh, we need uh, we need uh, to uh, educate people uh, because uh, the <laughs> what uh, what I uh, see in our country uh, the this is the main pillar of the of the success uh, uh, of the of the good results of reform or reform process. If you have uh, qualified uh, people uh, with uh, good uh, competencies, language competencies, uh, with uh, uh, open approach uh, and more, maybe I, I have to say, a more liberal uh, uh, attitude, uh, it uh, will be better for, for the uh, application of, the, of the, a lot of uh, many reforms in uh, different sectors. So, uh, the main message is that uh, the problems is not caused by the reforms, but usually uh, they, the problems uh, are bigger uh, as uh, the reforms goes too slowly. Thank you. I have uh, also a 
have a question. Uh, what do you consider was the hardest problem to overcome to your way uh, on democracy in Slovakia? It was the period in 1994-1998. Uh, as I said, uh, this uh, coalition of uh, alternative populists uh, caused a lot of problems and uh, only this time we are able to to see to our mirror. <laughs> uh, it uh, really, really uh, uh, a little early, uh, too late, I think, because uh, because uh, only today we can open uh, discuss about the problems, the real problems, and uh, what was the very good for uh, for society in Slovakia was that, as I said before, we don't uh, uh, nobody nobody give us the package of the integration to EU and, and we have to we had to fight for it and it was the main factor for mobilization of civic society and we have now very strong civic society a lot of NGOs a lot of organizations uh, a lot of very active students for example uh, still uh, we have so uh, I think uh, now we have uh, very very health uh, Society, I think uh, the young society, uh, and this is our advantage uh, compared to, for example, Czech, Poland, and uh, Serb Republic Poland and uh, Hungary today. Uh, so, as uh, because I I can show you uh, now uh, some data which we collect uh, as the project of one uh, NGO organization called. Uh, Klopsek. Uh, two years ago, I established uh, the Klopsek Academy Center, the first think tank in Slovakia by the university. And uh, we published this analysis. So-called vulnerability index, index, we uh, should four countries. Let's see this. Public perception, political landscape, media, state countermeasures, and civil society. And uh, these uh, results show us where we have the weak points and strong points. Because, uh, as you see, as you can see, Slovakia is now uh, was uh, defined as the most vulnerable country in the region in terms of public opinion and perception, for example, of US, Russia, EU, and NATO, with a score of 53. It was some methodological aspect. The so perception of Russia, US, the EU Atlantic integration, and uh, its institution in Slovakia has been conditioned by uh, really several, several conflicting factors. Uh, as I said before, find a strong Protestant and Russian public attitude beside each other and both have uh, in Slovakia strong historical, political and social sources. Uh, I don't know if you heard about the uh, speech uh, uh, of our uh, uh, Chief of Parliament uh, yesterday in uh, Moscow and our President in Strasbourg. And this is, this is the uh, typical case uh, how uh, this is a really, really Dichotomia between between the uh, the elites. Uh, it uh, shows that uh, our society is divided between Protestant uh, oriented and uh, 
I don't. I can't say the person, but but maybe some romantic uh, mm -hmm. ideas about the, about the Russian attitudes towards Slavs uh, or something like that. Uh, I show you other uh, data. <coughs> It's not that, but I... This is the... Uh, we have we made some conclusions uh, after the after the, our research, and one of the uh, conclusion is that uh, Czechs, uh, Hungarians, and Slovaks favor a neutral position between West and East, despite being members of both the EU and NATO. And uh, the second one is that uh, people versus politicians, in contrast to the Eurosceptic political rhetoric coming from uh, really some parts of the Central and Eastern European public support for the EU remains very high uh, across the region. Uh, NATO membership is valued as a security guarantee in the region today, but support for hosting NATO facilities is required in four out of seven uh, represented countries. And uh, Liberal democracy, six out of seven countries, the majority prefers liberal democracy or strong autocratic leaders. Media, uh, two thirds of Poles and Croats do, don't believe media provided true pictures of reality. Uh, 10 million people in Central European region trust fake news and disinformation websites. And the young people are much more prone to trust fake news than any other age groups. And what is uh, that? Uh, uh, the problem and that's the reason why we are very active in uh, now the uh, promoting the subject like critical thinking like uh, disinformation like uh, uh, educate people what uh, this information campaign means and so so if you see this uh, results for example uh, all to uh, that we have very good economic uh, uh, results now, really economic success what we have in Slovakia, you can see that only 21% feel that they are part of the West. And this is the, uh, what I, uh, I, I see that the main problem is in the educational sector. We have so-called lost generation <laughs> after 2009, uh, and uh, 1991 and today, for example, I am very active last two three years because the, the government and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, ask us to write, for example, the uh, books uh, to for uh, for uh, the students at the and, uh, and the either high schools or or uh, elementary schools about EU about NATO. They don't know nothing <coughs> about EU and NATO. Because uh, the date in geography, history, or the Savic, uh, what you have as a chance can uh, the subject, uh, which, uh, subjects dealing with the, with the life in society, uh, they don't know these books mention about the other membership in the EU NATO, for example. Very good to see that for example, Eurosceptics in the uh, the most uh, Eurosceptic people stay in the EU is a good thing. Czech Republic is the more most ex Eurosceptic uh, society in the Central European area today. to the rhetoric of the Prime Minister Orban, for example, in Hungary, is against the EU, uh, the public opinion is not against the EU. Or NATO. Mm -hmm. 
pray or completely agree that the membership uh, in NATO is important for their safety. You can see, uh, for example, uh, Poland and uh, Croatia, Hungary, rather or completely agree that the membership in NATO is important for their safety. But uh, if you see Slovakia, it's 55% yes, but 54 rather completely disagree with this statement. Liberal democracy. Which political system would be the best for your country? <coughs> Autocracy is the red. So it's red in the red color. So you can see Bulgaria, Croatia, Romania, 37, 35, Czech Republic, 30, and uh, Visegrad, four countries around uh, 25 percent. This is very, very specific. Uh, on average, 60% of adult population countries would prefer to make uh, decisions concerning their country by referendum and direct voting. It seems that a large group of the population in every country uh, believes citizens to be more competent uh, and entitled uh, to, to steer the course of their country directly rather than and power, this power to elected representatives. representatives. And uh, Visegrad countries show lower uh, sympathy uh, to their prime ministers, for example. <laughs> Uh, to Trump, Merkel, or Putin. Look at this. Donald Trump, Romania, 40%. <coughs> Other countries, about 30, 35. Angela Merkel, Croatia, almost 80%. Poland, 59. Vladimir Putin, Bulgaria, which is the most popular in Bulgaria. And uh, this was popular in three, four countries. You can see here. That's the surprising uh, because uh, Germany is the most important uh, economic partner, Germany. But uh, after the immigration crisis, uh, Slovak population is. Uh, is I think uh, my point of view is that was uh, that's the reason of this information campaign about migration as a whole as a problem. But for me it's surprising that 40 percent of Slovakia uh, still positively uh, see towards uh, Moscow. Fake news. Widespread distrust of media, 70, almost 70 percent of Poles, 63 percent of Croats, and 57 percent of Romanians. Look at this: media distrust and disinformation. The red uh, color is the respondents who don't believe the mainstream media. So these are challenges uh, for our society today and uh, we really don't we have to pay attention 
for these uh, topics because it's very uh, important for our stability or political stability in the future. Maybe I uh, Uh, the uh, very very important things are now the that uh, for example we had the regional elections uh, two weeks ago in Slovakia and the message was that we that the people don't want uh, extremist parties for example because we had uh, four years in for example in Slovakia in Moscow, this is a region. Uh, the, the, and the main position, the chef of the region was the representative of the uh, extremist uh, nationalist party, we can say fascist party. Mm -hmm. As a result of uh, big disappointing and of the mainstream political parties before. So please, questions? Uh, when I listened to this election, I understood that the our country has uh, some same moments in the Arab history. Uh, uh, the 1992nd year uh, will be hard, hard for for our country. Uh, we, uh, I mean Ukraine, uh, started to live uh, independent life, and uh, Czechoslovakia Republic have uh, problems because, as I understood, uh, some political elite or conquer the political power in the country but he doesn't uh, but he doesn't know how to do in future in with this power and as a, as the result uh, the uh, NATO and the euro uh, says that um, Czechoslovak was uh, don't uh, don't became the part of Europe because he has a low democracy level. But uh, but when uh, the 10 or 50 years ago, uh, the political regimes and political situation in the country was changes, and uh, the, uh, the Czechoslovakia was became the 2004, yeah, 2004 became the part of Europe. Uh, in your opinion, do you agree uh, that the Ukraine uh, too has uh, just uh, 10 or 50 years to 10 or 50 years to become a part of Europe and became the strong economic country? I think uh, it depends on the on the speed and quality of reform process and. Uh, I don't think that there is uh, okay. Maybe, maybe today, maybe next uh, two, three, four years, there is no political will to 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 towards the enlargement eh, of the EU. But uh, I think uh, new political situation, maybe after the five, ten years. Uh, will show us that uh, we can stop the EU enlargement, we can go forward and uh, if uh, the countries like Ukraine will be prepared to accept the all conditions, uh, you, you can may, maybe you can know about the, about the Kodan, uh, Copenhagen criteria. So that's the, uh, that's the answer that uh, all countries have the chance to be the member it depends on the, on the reforms and the success of these reforms. And uh, I hope that there will be no any deal between the big powers about the status of Ukraine in the future. Because all countries have have right uh, to choose their future. And uh, that I hope that there is the 21st century will be known the world of when uh, the powers can define their sphere of influence. But we must change some laws and some people have some political powers. Yes, yes so as, as I said, as we uh, uh, did in Slovakia, structural reforms, uh, rule of law. Uh, okay, we are not a uh, super country in, in this uh, in this uh, uh, terms, but but uh, I think that uh, uh, 
I see big potential in, in Ukraine because of the because of the uh, qualified, educated people, because of the uh, base infrastructure which could be modernized, but uh, it takes some time, of course, and uh, because of the effort of the, a lot of EU, EU countries uh, to help. And I hope that uh, after after the next election in US, uh, US will be more. Uh, helpful uh, to to Ukraine as well. But uh, you can't be you can't uh, be dependent only on the external help. You can you can do uh, a lot of work uh, here in Ukraine, and you can uh, expect uh, massive massive. Uh, uh, help uh, material finance or, or uh, something. So now today, you, you <coughs> what we missed in the 19 in 90s uh, is that uh, there was no any uh, so-called Marshall Plan. So maybe something like that will help uh, to countries like Ukraine or uh, Georgia or maybe in Belarus in, uh, in future uh, Moldavia. So in the partnership uh, countries, uh, but uh, there is no no chance, I think, uh, to wait uh, something like to expect something like that. Okay. Thank you for your attention. I wish you good luck, <laughs> and uh, I hope that we can uh, continue our discussion maybe next year. Which one is that? Oh, we can discuss about about your dean, and I, I'm not sure that uh, okay. there is. A, so maybe we, we will see. <laughs> Thank you for the lecture.